here we are with lecture 7 for microbiology. This is going to correspond to the Bauman text chapter 7 and Tortora text chapter 8. We're going to be looking at the genome and microbial genetics. This is a long chapter and it is a fairly detailed and challenging chapter. So don't be too frustrated with yourself here. Just be patient and know that you're probably going to have to look at this more than once and break it down into smaller chunks to study. Your genome is the entire genetic component of the cell. Genetics is your study of inheritance and inheritable traits. It tends to look at more of the smaller units of things. The study of genomics actually will compare whole entire genomes. Your gene is going to be a sequence that codes for a specific polypeptide or RNA. Your nucleotides are going to be the building blocks of the nucleic acids. That's going to be what things are made out of. So we have the base pairs, which are your specific pairs of the nitrogenous bases. Guanine and cytosine pair together, adenine and thymine and DNA. It's going to be adenine and uracil and guanine and cytosine and RNA. Your 5' prime end of the molecule is going to terminate with a phosphate group on carbon number 5, where the 3' prime end terminates with a hydroxyl group on carbon number 3. What we see is that the strands run anti-parallel to each other, so one goes 5' prime to 3', prime, the other goes 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This will be important to see when we look at how the molecule copies each, each other. Your genotypes, the genetic makeup of the individual, it, is the potential properties that could be expressed in those genes. Where the phenotype is what we actually see, or the appearance, to your expressed properties. Back in 1956, Francis Crick proposed this central dogma of molecular biology, that DNA is used to make RNA and RNA is used to make protein. That was a good foundation to get us started, but it's not entirely accurate. We do know that some things only go as far as becoming RNA, and those molecules are used themselves. When we look at the prokaryotic genome, the chromosome is the organized molecule of DNA with its associated proteins. They're typically circular in the bacteria. They have one or two of them, and the cells are haploid. It's not just back-to-back -back genes. There's actually going to be these non-coding short tandem repeats. These are repeating sequences of two to five bases. Your nucleoid region is going to be the area of the cell where you find the bacterial chromosome. Of course, the archaea are going to be a little bit different here. Their chromosomes are still haploid circular, but they're also going to be wrapped around histone proteins, which makes them different than the bacterial chromosomes. Your plasmids are small circular DNA molecules. These will replicate independently of the chromosome. Your F plasmids are used for fertility. It provides the instructions for bacterial conjugation. Your R plasmids are the resistance plasmids. So these are going to code for resistance to one or more antimicrobial drugs or heavy metals, other things that are used to try and fight bacterial infections. Your bacteriocin plasmids are going to carry genes for bacteriocins or toxins. These are used to kill competitor bacteria. They can kill bacteria of the same or similar species that don't have the factor. It's a way of dealing with the competition. Your virulence plasmids, these are going to carry genes for enzymes or toxins that actually make the bacteria pathogenic. Some bacteria are not pathogenic at all without these virulence plasmids. So here we have an image of your chromosome, the DNA. Here is your DNA. It's going to form these nucleosome beads that will be scaffolded. It wraps around fibers. So they continue to fold upon each other to make what you finally have in your final condensed chromosome. So the eukaryotic genome is going to be slightly different. It's often diploid. It's usually going to have more than one chromosome, and they're linear. The nuclear envelope's a double membrane that surrounds the genetic material. You'll have histones, which are globular proteins used in packaging the DNA into chromosomes. DNA has a negative charge. Histones have a positive charge, so the DNA will easily wrap around these. It wraps around to form these nucleosomes, which are 10 nanometer beads of DNA wrapped around histones. Your chromatin is the nucleosomes that get clumped with their associated proteins to form these 30 nanometer fibers. 
these are dispersed throughout the nucleus. Your chromatid is just a single leg of the chromosome. Then we have some extra nuclear DNA. In most cases, it's in the mitochondria, chloroplast, plasmids. These will usually replicate the prokaryotic chromosomes. We see some fungi, algae, and protozoa carry plasmids. With DNA replication, it's going to bring its own energy and the high energy bonds of the molecule itself. This can be kind of a challenging process to learn, especially just reading words about it. I find that videos are extremely helpful here, so I strongly encourage you to look at all of these video clips in your notes. So there is, it is a semi-conservative replication. So when you look at your daughter strands, it's going to have one strand of the original. Here would be your daughter strands. One is the original. One is made up of new components. Your initial process begins at what we call the origin. It's going to be where you create a little bubble, and DNA helicase will unzip the DNA and it expose the nucleotides in the replication fork. You can see here where it's starting to pull apart. These are your replication forks. DNA polymerase binds the strand and is going to add nucleotides onto the three prime end. It only adds onto the three prime end. So here, where you had the bubble at the start, you're just going to keep adding on to this 3' prime end as you progress in. Over here, you are going to have your 3' prime end out here. So we need to start at a 5' prime end, and so you're going to go part way through and then work your way back. You'll jump ahead, work your way back, jump ahead and work your way back. So this is going to be your lagging strand that's going to be synthesized in these short segments that get joined up later. So here's another video clip of DNA replication to watch. We're going to look at it in a little bit more detail here. So when we go to make this leading strand, primase enzyme is going to synthesize your RNA primer. It's going to be complementary to that DNA template. This requires having a 3' hydroxyl that's required by the RNA polymerase. The triphosphate deoxyribonucleotides are going to hydrogen bond to the complements of the parental strands. DNA polymerase 3 will covalently join the parent strand using energy from the triphosphate deoxyribonucleotides. This will add on at a rate of 500 to 1,000 nucleotides per second. One of the nice things with DNA polymerase 3 is it proofreads as it goes. Initially, you have 1 in 100,000 nucleotides that are mismatched, but after DNA polymerase 3 has proofread things, it will decrease the errors to about 1 in a billion base pairs. You'll use the enzyme exonuclease to remove the error. And then DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primer with DNA. In making that lagging strand, you're going to have primase synthesize RNA primers, and you're going to have multiple primers. The nucleotides are going to pair with their complements. DNA polymerase 3 will join the nucleotides and proofread, but instead it's going to do it in these discontinuous segments called the Okazaki fragments. They're usually 1,000 to 2,000 nucleotides long in bacteria. Each fragment will require a new primer. So DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primer of the Okazaki fragments and further proofreads, and then DNA ligase will come along and join the Okazaki fragments together. And so we have yet another replication animation here to look at. So we typically see that synthesis is going to be bidirectional. It's going to proceed in both directions from the origin. So when the origin opens up, it's going to create two replication forks, and you'll have two sets of enzymes. Gyrase and topoisomerase are going to remove the supercoils from unwinding. So when you open things up, all that coiling is going to get pushed out further down the molecule, and rather than having it be supercoiled and stopping it from flowing through, you'll unwind the DNA by cutting it, rotating it, and then rejoin the ends together. So, and we have another DNA replication video. With methylation, you add methyl groups to one or two base pairs that are part of a specific nucleotide group. This can be used to help control genetic expression and turn genes on and off. It plays a role in initiating DNA replication. It helps protect against viral infection because viral DNA is not methylated and then be used in the repair of DNA. So when we look at replication of eukaryotic DNA, it is a little bit similar. 
it will use helicases and topoisomerases to uncoil the DNA. And then the protein molecules stabilize the molecule similar to bacteria. It will use different DNA polymerases. There's one used to initiate things and synthesize the primer. A second one will elongate the leading strand. A third elongates a lagging strand. A fourth replicates mitochondrial DNA, and so on. So there is a little bit of variation. You can have thousands of origins of replication due to having long linear chromosomes. The Okazaki fragments are shorter. They're usually only 100 to 400 nucleotides long. And they only methylate cytosine in plants and animals. So your genotype is going to be the set of genes in the genome of the organism. The genetic makeup, the phenotype is what you actually see, the physical features. Transcription is going to be this initial part where you're going to use DNA and make an RNA copy from that template. In translation, this is where you're going to take the step of actually synthesizing polypeptides or proteins from that RNA copy. You can think of DNA being the master set of instructions. The RNA is like a photocopy of the instructions that you'll use to make your final product, your proteins or polypeptides. So your events in transcription, you've got your mRNA. This is going to be the RNA that is made from the DNA. It's going to carry your genetic information from the chromosome to the ribosomes, which are actually your organelle used for protein synthesis. An RNA, an RNA primer is going to be used by DNA polymerase during DNA replication. Your rRNA is ribosomal RNA. This combines with the ribosomal polypeptides to be part of the structure of the ribosomes. We also have regulatory RNA that will interact with the DNA. This helps to control gene expression. In humans, only 1.5% of the DNA is genes, so there's a lot of regulatory portions in there. The tRNA or transfer RNA is going to be what delivers the amino acids to the ribosomes. Ribozyme is going to be when the RNA molecules themselves will act as enzymes. So if we look at the steps of transcription, at the beginning we have initiation. Here you're going to have your RNA polymerase bind the promoter. The sigma factor is necessary to recognize the promoter in bacteria. It's going to unwind and unzip the DNA. Your promoter is going to be a region near the beginning of the gene. This is going to initiate transcription. Not all RNA polymerase binds to all promoters equally strong. It will affect the amount and type of protein transcribed. So here you can see we've got a promoter, an RNA polymerase coming on here with your sigma factor. The sigma factor is seen in bacteria. It's the part of the RNA polymerase that is needed for recognition of the promoter. Transcription factors are proteins used in eukaryotes. They're going to help bind the RNA polymerase to the primer. So during the elongation phase, this begins when you have about 10 nucleotides away from the promoter. And while you're transcribing those first 10 ribonucleotides, RNA polymerase releases its sigma factor and allows it to adhere to the DNA tightly. Many RNA polymerases can concurrently transcribe the same gene. And it's going to link the new nucleotides in the 5' to 3' direction. So when you're making your RNA, you're going to use an RNA polymerase. When you're making DNA, you use a DNA polymerase. There are some differences. RNA polymerase unwinds itself, or it unwinds the DNA itself. It doesn't require a helicase. It tends to be slower, only about 50 nucleotides per second. It's going to incorporate ribonucleotides instead of deoxyribonucleotides. So this means you're going to use uracil instead of thymine. It has less efficient proofreading. The errors are one every 10,000 nucleotides. And it's only going to copy one of the DNA strands. So when you get to the end, we're going to have termination. This is when the RNA polymerase and the transcribed RNA are released. There's a couple different ways this can happen. With self-termination, we've got a terminator sequence. The RNA polymerase transcribes the terminator sequence. It's rich in G and C bases, and then it's followed by a region rich in A and U. It slows down in the D and G C region because it has three hydrogen bonds to form. 
between them and then it will form a stem and loop structure to start to put tension on the structure and then cools off in the adenine rich area. So other types of termination, you can have enzyme dependent or row dependent. Here it depends on a termination protein that binds to a specific sequence near the end of the RNA transcript. Your protein is going to move towards the 3' prime end and it will force the RNA polymerase and DNA apart. So we do have some small differences in eukaryotic transcription. It's going to be in the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell, where it's in the cytoplasm of the prokaryotic cell. Eukaryotes will have different RNA polymerases. The transcription factors assist in binding the RNA polymerase to the promoter. They'll shed their transcription factors and then recruit separate elongation factors. And then the eukaryotes must process their mRNA before it's translated. So there's three main things we see in RNA processing in the eukaryotes. You add a 5' prime cap, add a poly A tail, and then they'll do splicing to remove the introns. Remember those introns are your intervening sequences, where the exons are the expressed or actual coding sequences. So we've got a couple more animations here to help support this information. Remember, translation is going to be where your ribosomes read the genetic information and use those instructions to synthesize your polypeptide. So with your genetic code, it's nearly universal. There's very few exceptions. It's redundant, so that you're going to see more than one codon associated with each amino acid. When we come down here and look at this codon table here, here you can see there would be four different codons that would go with proline, four different ones that go with leucine, actually six different ones that go with leucine, four down here with alanine, four with glycine, etc. Your codons are going to be the triplets of mRNA nucleotides that are going to code for a specific amino acid. Where it starts is always at the first AUG. AUG is going to code for methionine in eukaryotes and N-formal methionine in prokaryotes. You're also going to see the F-methionine in mitochondria and chloroplasts. It's going to know it reaches the end when it gets to a stop sequence. There are three of them, UAA, UAG, and UGA. Your mRNA is going to be the messenger RNA. This is going to carry the AUG to start, and then it will have sequential codons and at least one stop codon. With your prokaryotic ribosomes, they can start translation before transcription is even done. So here we can see actually you've got your mRNA, and here you see three base pairs at a time coming in. These are your codons that are going to code for specific amino acids. And these are your tRNAs coming in and bringing those amino acids in. When you read the codon table, you look at the first base on the left and line it up, then the second base on the top, and the third on the right. So for example, AUG, you find A on the left, U on the top. It's going to bring you down to this box, and then the G in this box comes over here. If you had CCG, you would find C here, C here, bring it down into this box. Your third letter is over here. All four letters are going to code for the same thing, proline. So there are some differences in the eukaryotic versus the prokaryotic cells here. Eukaryotic mRNA is going to have these non-coding regions, and it's considered your pre-mRNA that you make initially. Your introns are the non-coding regions that get removed to make your functional mRNA. The introns are your intervening sequences. Your exons are going to be your expressed regions or coding regions. Eukaryotic mRNA carries instructions for only one polypeptide, where there may be more than one in prokaryotes. Eukaryotic mRNA is not translated until it's fully transcribed and moves out of the nucleus. So in prokaryotes, it doesn't have to wait for it to be fully transcribed. It can start reading before the copy is entirely made because it's all in the same compartment. With eukaryotes being in different compartments, it has to wait until it's already done and moves into the cytoplasm. So SNRPs, these are small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. These are going to remove the introns and splice the exons together. 
In some introns, they will actually act as a ribozyme and catalyze their own removal. So tRNAs, these are made up of about 75 ribonucleotides. They form these three main hairpin loops, and they will act as an acceptor site for specific amino acids at the three prime end. And then as an anticodon, it's going to be complementary to the codon at the bottom of the loop. Up here, you can see this is our example of a tRNA. Here is going to be your complementary anticodon, and here is where you're going to have your amino acids attached. So the anticodon is the triplet at the bottom of the tRNA that pairs to the codon. So although there's 64 codons, some organisms actually have fewer t than 64 tRNAs due to the wobble on the third nucleotide. So when we look at this codon table here, you'll notice it is just the third nucleotide that's different. So A and C are the same. What you have in the third position, it will take any of them. This is what we call the wobble. So with the wobble on there, it can bond to a nucleotide other than the normal one just by changing the angle. Frequently it's a change in the third nucleotide, and that usually doesn't change the amino acid. With degeneracy, we see most amino acids are signaled by several alternative codons, such as leucine that has six, alanine has four. This does allow for a certain amount of misreading or mutation without it actually affecting the protein source. So it just allows for a little bit more flexibility in our structure. Ribosomes, so they're slightly different sizes here. So your ribosome is 70S in prokaryotes, 80S in eukaryotes. Each of them is going to have two subunits. The smaller subunit is going to be shaped to accommodate three codons at one time. So it's got three sites in it. The A site is going to accommodate the incoming tRNA delivering an amino acid. Your P site is going to hold the growing polypeptide, and the E site is going to be where the tRNA exits. So if we come back up here and look, here is your smaller subunit, here's your larger subunit. The A site, this is where your new tRNA comes in. The P site, this is where you're going to have your growing polypeptide. And then here's your E site, where this is going to be ejected out when you're done. So with the ribosomes, they have smaller subunits. So the prokaryotes have a 50S and a 30S subunit. The 50S is going to have a 23S and a 5S ribosomal RNA and 34 peptides, 34 polypeptides. The 30S is going to be composed of a 16S ribosomal RNA and 21 ribosomal polypeptides. Eukaryotes a little bit larger, the ADS is going to have a 40S and a 60S subunit. The larger ribosomal RNA and more, it's going to have larger ribosomal RNA and more polypeptides than what you find in the prokaryotes. So here we've got an animation that's going to show translation occurring. So there are different stages to translation. During initiation, you're going to have your mRNA the two ribosomal subunits, the tRNA, and several protein factors form what we call an initiation complex. The smaller subunits attach to the mRNA with the start codon at the P site. The tRNA will attach to the start codon at the PT P site, and GTP is going to supply its binding energy. <coughs> then the larger ribosome will come in and attach to form the complex. During elongation, the tRNA matches the next codon and will attach to the A site. Your elongation factor protein moves to escort the tRNA with GTP. This energy is going to come from GTP. It's also used to stabilize the tRNA and the A site. Your larger subunits, ribozyme, will form peptide bonds between the terminal amino acid and the new amino acid you just brought down and then the polypeptide is attached to the tRNA on the A site. Again, using GTP energy, the ribosome is going to move down one codon and transfer the tRNA to the next adjacent site. 
the ribosome will release the empty tRNA from the E site and it will go out and be recharged with new amino acids. The cycle can repeat itself. You can actually allow another ribosome to follow it as it elongates. And this will occur at a rate of about 15 amino acids per second. So again, I strongly recommend watching the animations of the process happen. This picture here, again, is a diagram of it, but the animations seem to be more helpful. So polyribosome, this is when you're going to have more than one ribosome reading that mRNA. So after one ribosome exposes the start, additional ribosomes can attach behind the first one. During termination, a release factor is going to halt elongation. It recognizes the stop codon, and it mo modifies your large subunit to activate the ribosome to sever from the polypeptide from the final tRNA, and then you will have your subunits dissociate. So controlling transcription has been something that's been what we've been studying quite a bit lately. About 75% of genes are expressed all the time, but others are going to be regulated, so the polypeptides are only synthesized when needed. We do see some difference in translation in the eukaryotes. Initiation occurs when the small ribosomal subunit binds the 5' cap instead of specific nucleotides. Your first amino acid is going to be methionine rather than F-methionine. And your ribosomes of the rough ER can actually synthesize the polypeptides into the cavity of the rough ER. RK translation is going to be more similar to the eukaryotes than the bacteria, but they don't have an endoplasmic reticulum, so you won't see that portion. So one of the ways of controlling gene expression is the prokaryotic operons. Operons are going to consist of a promoter, an adjacent operator, and a series of genes, which are going to code for enzymes and structures. It's going to be everything you have needed to make these structures together, and it's going to have one switch that's the control switch for it. Your operator are going to be the regulatory elements where the repressor protein would bind and stop transcription. So there are several pictures of it here. Reading about these operons a lot of times is somewhat confusing, so I strongly recommend the videos again. So here you're going to have your genes that are related to the LAC operon. You've got a regulatory gene, a promoter, terminator, promoter, and terminator. Inducible operons are ones that are not usually transcribed. They usually have to be turned on and activated by an inducer. A repressible operon is going to be transcribed continuously until something comes along, like a repressor to deactivate it. So your lactose operon is one that's been studied quite a bit. It's an inducible operon that's going to include a promoter, an operator, and three genes that are used for the catabolism of lactose. It's controlled by a regulatory gene that's going to be constantly transcribed. And it's going to be translated to make a repressor protein that will attach to the LAC operator and prevent RNA polymerase from moving beyond the promoter. So when lactose is available, it's going to act as an inducer. It changes the structure of the repressor and allows transcription to take place when LAC is depleted. So here the repressor becomes active again. This is a way of having this series of genes turn on to make the enzymes when lactose is present. You don't need to make enzymes to digest lactose if it's not present. So there's two events that activate the LAC operon. It's going to have positive regulation by the metabolite activator protein, and then you can have deactivation of the repressor. So with the positive regulation by the cap or catabolic activator protein, E. coli is going to use glucose more effectively and it will avoid using lactose if glucose is available. So when glucose is low, cyclic AMP accumulates. This signals glucose starvation and it binds a regulatory protein called the catabolite activator protein. So this cap is going to bind to cap binding sites near the lac operon. RNA polymerase is going to be more attracted to LAC operons promoters with this, and it will enhance 
lack transcription. So we have some repression and induction here. Lack operon is controlled by a regulatory gene, and there's regulatory genes outside the operon. It's usually transcribed constantly, and it produces a repressor that binds the LAC operator and prevents RNA polymerase from binding. So the LAC operon is usually inactive, even if the catabolite activator protein is present. When LAC's available, it gets converted to allolactose that induces the LAC operon by inactivating the repressor. So then the RNA polymerase can bind, and it will translate the LAC genes. Once LAC is depleted, there's no more allolactose, and the repressor can be active again. So here's a couple different movies on the LAC operon. There are several different videos and animations on this on YouTube. I would encourage you to watch as many different ones as you need until it starts to make sense to you. Again, the animations are going to make a lot more sense than just reading through all these terms. So your repressible operon is what we see with the tryptophan operon. This is a way for the cell to save energy. It's going to have a promoter, an operator, and five genes for enzymes in the synthesis of tryptophan. Normally the repressor is inactive, so when tryptophan isn't present, this tryptophan operon is active. And when tryptophan is available, it activates the repressor and binds the operator to stop RNA polymerase and transcription. So with the LAC operon, it gets induced and turned on when lactose is present and it needs to digest it. With the tryptophan operon, when tryptophan is present, it's going to shut it down so that it doesn't waste energy making tryptophan when it can get it from the environment. So again, there are a couple of videos here that are helpful in making sense of these operons. So we have other regulatory RNA molecules. These are used to regulate the translation of the polypeptides. So microRNAs, here eukaryotic cells transcribe these single-stranded microRNAs. They're not translated, but they're going to join with these regulatory proteins to make these microRNA-induced silencing complexes. These will bind to complementary mRNA, and they can cut the mRNA to disable it. They can hide it from ribosomes and have their ways of blocking translation. This is used to regulate embryogenesis, apoptosis, cell division, blood cell formation, and cancer among other things. So anything that has to do with cancer you do tend to see a lot more research in trying to understand it. The small interfering RNAs, these are double-stranded, and they may be complementary to mRNAs, tRNAs, or DNA. These are going to join with uh, risk proteins to form small interfering risk complexes. These are going to bind and cut the target nucleic acids to silence the genes. With riboswitch, here you've got RNA molecules that change the shape in response to environmental conditions. So some mRNAs can act as riboswitches that will either favor or block the translation depending on the conditions and what the cell needs. With epigenetic control, this is a way of turning genes on and off by methylation. So genes are turned off by methylating certain nucleotides. These methylated genes can be passed on to their offspring, but they can be turned on later again in another generation. Mutations are heritable changes in the nucleotide base sequence of the genome, particularly in genes. So with point mutations, you have one or just a few nucleotide bases that are affected. With a substitution, you insert the wrong nucleotide. With a frame shift mutation, you have an insertion or a deletion. With an insertion, you put in an extra nucleotide, and with a deletion, you remove a nucleotide. Both the insertions and deletions cause frame shift mutations. So your triplets subsequent to the mutation get displaced, and it creates new codons. It's similar to if you look at where you put a comma in a sentence, that it can have two different meanings. If you put, look at eat shoots and leaves, one might make you think of a cute little fuzzy animal gnawing on some plants in the woods. Another one may th make you think of somebody who comes in, eats some food, shoots you, and leaves. Two very different meanings based on how you cluster the words together. 
Other mutations include inversions, duplications, or transpositions. If you have a silent mutation, you're going to create a substitution that doesn't actually change the amino acid in the sequence. Here you're going to get the same product. With a missense mutation, it changes the nucleotide, resulting in a codon for a different amino acid. And then you get a different polypeptide. With a nonsense mutation, it changes the nucleotide and creates a stop codon. Usually these are going to stop early, so it's a non-functional protein. Mutagens, these are physical and chemical agents that will induce mutations. Spontaneous mutations are going to result from errors in replication and repair. There was no mutation causing agent. With recombination mutations, you have relatively long stretches of DNA that move along the chromosome. This will introduce frame shifts. So one type of mutagen is radiation. With ionizing radiation, you're using either x-rays or gamma rays. These energize the electrons to escape and strike other atoms. This will produce ions that can then cause mutations or break the DNA backbone and chromosomes. With non-ionizing radiation, the UV light causes the adjacent thymine bases to covalently bond to make thymine dimers. This can happen with other pyrimidines, and then we call them pyrimidine dimers. This prevents the hydrogen bonding with the adenines, and it will distort the sugar phosphate backbone. So what was originally an AT pair could then become a GC pair. So with chemical mutagens, these are chemicals that induce mutations. One category of these are the nucleotide and nucleoside analogs. These are going to look structurally similar to normal nucleotides, and they will incorporate into DNA, but they're going to inhibit the polymerases and lead to mismatch pairing. One example is 5-bromouracil, another one is 5-fluorouracil. A lot of antiviral and anti-cancer drugs are going to work this way, which does contribute to their toxicity because not only are they going to be incorporated into the cancer cells, but normal cells may incorporate these as well, interfering with your polymerases and your DNA synthesis there, along with making the proteins. Nucleotide altering chemicals will alter the structure of a nucleotide. For example, nitrous acid removes the amine off of an adenine and then converts it to a guanine analog. So here you have an AT pair that will change to a GC pair. Aflatoxin will convert guanine into thymine, so a GC pairing is converted to a TA base pair. We know that aflatoxin can cause cancer. Aflatoxin is a mold, found in a mold. It's found on grains and things like peanuts. Frame shift mutagens insert or delete nucleotide base pairs or slip between adjoining nucleotides. Some examples of these would be benzopyrene and smoke, ethidium bromine that's used as a stain for DNA. Acridine is a class of dyes that's used as a mutagen in genetic research. When we look at the mutation frequency, it's seen in one in a million genes. Mutagens increase the rate 10 to 1,000 times and induce error in one in 1,000 to one in 100,000 genes. If you're looking at the mutation rate, what that's really telling you is the probability that a gene will be mutated when the cell divides. These usually just get stated in powers of 10. When we look at repair, there's different ways we can repair. Direct repair is going to be something like base excision repair. An enzyme cuts out the erroneous base, and then a DNA polymerase fills in the gap with the correct one. Other DNA repair, your thymine or pyrimidine dimer repair. In prokaryotes, a DNA photolase enzyme becomes activated by visible light. This will break the bond between thymines. In light repair, the enzyme photolase is activated by light. It reverses the mutation and restores the original sequence. In dark repair in prokaryotes, it occurs in dark or light. Here it cuts the damaged section from the DNA, and it's then repaired by DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase. So it's more of a nucleotide excision repair. With single strand repair, you have mismatch repair. This scans the new DNA looking for errors to remove and then replaces and distinguishes the new DNA because the old strands are going to be methylated. 
error prone repair, this is a repair system of last resort. So with SOS repair, your damage is too extreme to repair. So this will use a new DNA polymerase that's capable of copying sequence with mistakes. This will introduce mutations into the population, but it does allow the offspring to survive. It involves novel DNA polymerases 4 and 5 that are able to copy less than perfect DNA. So our mutant cells are cells that do not successfully repair their mutations and their descendants. Your wild type cells are the ones that are normally found in nature. With positive selection, you would select a mutation by eliminating the wild type phenotypes. With negative selection or indirect selection, you select for the oxytrophic mutants. The oxytrophs are the organisms that have different nutritional requirements than their wild type phenotypes. So for example, you could do a selection of tryptophan oxytrophs. Here you would inoculate bacteria with potential mutants onto a media containing tryptophan. The colonies will grow. This includes both oxytrophs and wild, wild types. So you use a velvet pad to stamp and that will pick up on the plate and transfer cells from the colonies. So literally you have something that you put a velvet pad over that is the same size as the plate. You're going to push the velvet pad down on the colonies and then you're going to stamp that velvet onto another plate with tryptophan and a plate without tryptophan. This is called replicate plating. So you're able to identify the oxytropes growing on the media with the tryptophan, but not the media without the tryptophan. Then you can inoculate a colony of oxytropes onto a media with tryptophan. So the AIMS test is a test that screens for mutants. It assumes any mutagen is a potential carcinogen. It uses a salmonella that has a point mutation so that it is histidine negative oxytrope. You mix the mutants with liver extract and the suspected mutagen. The liver enzymes are used to stimu simulate conditions in which the substance becomes a mutagen. So this would be looking at things that would become mutagens in humans. Things are broken down in the liver and that's the reason for the liver enzymes. If it causes mutation, some of the mutants will revert and grow back on the media without histidine. Things that are carcinogenic or carcinogens are going to cause mutations that result in cancer. So a lot of mutations will result in cancer, it's just they tend to cause mutations in areas that alter cell regulation and those more likely end up as cancer. When we look at genetic recombination or transfer, genetic recombination is the exchange of two DNA molecules that are composed of homologous sequences. Your homologous sequences are the DNA segments of identical or nearly identical sequences. So recombinant DNA is going to be the DNA molecules that contain a new arrangement of nucleotide sequences, so the ones that have been manipulated. They are going to contain recombinant DNA. We're crossing over in eukaryotes, you have homologous chromosomes recombine while forming gametes. So vertical gene transfer, this is passing a copy of a genome from one generation to the next. The parent cell is going to pass it to the offspring. With horizontal gene transfer, this occurs in less than 1% of populations in the prokaryotes. It can acquire genes from another microbe in the same generation. You're going to have the donor cell that will contribute part of their genome to the recipient, and the recipient will actually take part of that cell in. It may be a different species or genus or the same. So with transformation, you have a recipient cell that takes up DNA from the environment, such as dead organisms. Cells that have the ability to take up DNA are said to be competent. This is going to result from alterations in the cell wall that make it permeable to large DNA molecules. Transduction, this is the transfer of DNA from one cell to another via replicating viruses. This can occur in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This is a second method of horizontal gene transfer. So transformation and transduction are slightly different. Phages or bacteriophages are viruses that will infect bacteria. A transducing phage is going to be a phage that pro whose proteins incorporate 
bacterial DNA along with the phage DNA when they assemble the new phage particles. So when they go to make copies of themselves, they're going to take some of the bacterial DNA with them. The phage attaches to the host and injects into the genome. The phage enzymes get translated by the host ribosomes, and it degrades the host cell DNA. The phage is going to direct the cell to make new phage DNA and proteins. Normally it will assemble the phage DNA and the phage proteins, but it may mistakenly incorporate some of the bacterial DNA along with it. Then the host cell lyses and it's going to release the daughter phages and transformed phages. Finally, a recipient host will incorporate the donated DNA into the chromosome by recombination. So with generalized and specialized transduction, generalized transduction has the phage carry random DNA segments from the donor and host cell to the recipient. All of the genes are equally likely to be packaged in the phage coat and transferred. With specialized transduction, it's only certain host sequences that are transferred along with that phage DNA. With bacterial conjugation, here the donor remains alive. You have a conjugation pili or a sex pili. These are just protein rods that are going to extend from the surface of the cell to transfer genetic materials. With your F plasmids, these are going to contain genes that code for the sex pili. The conjugated plasmid contains the F factors. Here you're going to have the sex pilus that will connect with the donor and recipient cell. The cells touch and stabilize. The donor is going to replicate one strand of the F plasmid and transfer it to the recipient cell. The F negative is going to synthesize the complementary strand and then it becomes an F positive cell. So our HFR cells are high frequency of recombination cells. Here the plasma does not remain in the cytosol but instead it integrates into the chromosome. It can also conjugate with an F negative cell. The F plasmid integrates into the chromosome. The HFR and the F negative cell join via the sex pillus. It's going to replicate the F plasmid. A new strand gets carried to the recipient along with a copy of the donor chromosome. Cells generally separate before the entire chromosome is transferred, but your recombinant will integrate part of that donor DNA into the recipient. With dissimilation plasmids, these are going to code for an enzyme that triggers catabolism of the usual sugars or hydrocarbons. Some of the Pseudomonas species can use exotic substances like toluene or comfer as a primary carbon and energy sources. So Pseudomonas a lot of times will actually live on some disinfectants. Transposons, these are segments of DNA that are between 700 and 40,000 base pairs. They can remove from, move from one location to another in the DNA. With transposition, you have the action of a transposon that acts like a frame shift mutation. This can occur in prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and viruses. Palinodromes, these are sequences that read the same forward and backwards. It's like the word dad. It's spelled the same forward and backwards. These are usually on both ends of the transposons. In genetics, the region of DNA in which the sequence of nucleotides is identical to an inverted sequence of the complementary strand. So you get an inverted repeat. So here we have a sequence of nucleotides that's identical to the inverted sequence in the complementary strand. So when you read it from 5' prime to 3', prime, you've got GAATTC. When you read it on the other strand, 5' prime to 3', prime, GAATTC. So transposase is going to recognize its own inverted repeat at a target site, and then it's going to cut DNA at that location, and then it will insert a transposon or a copy into DNA at that site. Insertion sequences are the simplest of transposons. So these are going to consist of no more than two inverted repeats and a gene encoding transposase. Complex transposons are going to contain one or more genes. These are not connected with the transposition, such as genes for antibiotic resistance. So your R plasmids, these are going to often contain transposons. Your R factors are the resistance factors. These are what's going to give resistance to the heavy metals or the toxins. So can, they can have two groups of genes. The R determinants have the resistance genes, and the RTF resistance transfactors 
transfer factor is going to include the genes for plasmid replication and conjugation. So that is the end of this section. Like I said, this is a very challenging section here. I do recommend breaking it up into smaller parts to study. Email me if you need help. And this is, make sure you use those videos. You'll find them helpful.